Well, now I want to turn to Steve Sherrill. And he has a special guest tonight that I'll let him introduce. Uh, but Steve uh, has started this segment, What Do You Want to Talk About? So Steve, what do you want to talk about? Tonight, I think we're going to talk about something that's uh, relatively new to the hobby. Um, 3D printing. It's been around for a little bit, uh, a few years, I think. But now, of course, the, the, uh, the new printers are getting much cheaper and much better as far as the production of uh, the detailed models they're turning out. Um, I have been very fortunate to have a friend, Bob Gelmacher, who is into 3D printing. He's got three, three machines, I believe. And uh, he, he lives pretty close by. And he is uh, really a, a wonderful modeler, has a great looking layout. And he has made some special cars and uh, things that I can use on my railroad. So with that, I'm, I'm going to show some of the 3D models that I have on my railroad just to show you the different varieties that are produced. Every one of these cars is different. You can see some of them are engines, cabooses, pastor cars, third trucks for geared locomotives, hopper cars. I think I have about um, 12 or 14 varieties here that are all different. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bob who will give you some more explanation on how the machines operate, the designing some of the products and uh, just a, a general overview of 3D printing. So Bob, if you would go ahead, I'd appreciate it. Okay, thanks. And uh, I'll correct, correct you in one regard, Steve. I actually have about seven of those machines right now. So, and a couple more on order, but um, I really enjoy 3D printing. As it turns out for me, um, my model railroading has taken a couple of turns and one of them was with making a lot of trees. So I spent a number of years doing that. And then I got into 3D printing. And once I got into it, I realized that I could probably make a lot of my own rolling stock. And then once I had a chance to meet Steve and talk with him, he gave me a lot of great ideas about things that could be used in the hobby that maybe hadn't been produced yet. I was gonna say what I'm gonna show you now for a little bit later, but I only have about nine minutes left on this print that I was going to show. So I'm gonna send it and point my camera right to my one 3D printer. So hold on. And this particular printer is uh, one of four that I have like it. It's called a Prusa. And basically it operates by taking a very thin filament of plastic. The filament's about 1.75 millimeters in diameter and shoots it through a nozzle that heats that filament up and then lays down that plastic in a pattern that is dictated by the software that we use to design the things. In this particular case, uh, we're finishing up a print on a gondola. The gondola is going to be about oh, three inches long, which would be about 12 feet in O scale. And it has braces on the side. The nice thing about it is with these printers, we can get a lot of detail. And I'm going to show you some additional pieces in a few minutes. There are essentially, I'm going to go back to me. There's essentially um, two basic types of 3D printers that uh, are in the market today. There are many, many manufacturers, but the two types are the filament printer that I just showed you, which takes that that string of, of uh, or filament of plastic and melts it and lays it down. And the other one is called a resin printer. And the resin printer takes a vat of, of UV sensitive liquid and exposes that liquid to the UV light in a pattern. And then the piece that we're making actually comes out of that liquid. Now, one of the best ways I can show, explain it to you, if you've ever seen the movie Terminator, where the uh, one really bad guy comes down and is made of a very meltable metal, and he melts down a couple of times, and then all of a sudden kind of builds back up to his original shape. That's what it looks a lot like in the uh, 3D printing world, especially in the resin printer. So we're actually building layer upon layer upon layer to get there. 
Um, I'm going to show you a couple of the different things that I've had a chance to play with and make uh, with the 3D printer. And once I realized that I could get away with making my own rolling stock, uh, there's a lot of possibilities. This happens to be the equivalent of one of the Bachman, I think it's 24 or 28 foot uh, uh, flat cars. And uh, we were able to print a lot of the detail on the bottom. Uh, there's about four or five different pieces there. But on this particular piece, the only things that I had to buy were the wheels and the couplers. Uh, I also went in partners with the uh, touch toggle guy, uh, Kevin Hunter, and we bought a small laser and uh, we're able to print our own decks. And we're doing that like crazy right now. And if you can see, we can only print nail holes in there. Hmm. Uh, this car is weighted down. There's a, a void between the bottom piece here and this outer shell. And there's a very thin a tray of number eight buckshot that's been glued in there and that gives the weight to the car. So that's the longer car. Then this is a shorter version. This is equivalent to like the 18 footer. Now this one I put uh, the um, brake wheels on and it also has the undercarriage details. And then yet an even shorter version. And this is about the same length as that piece that I was just showing you on the, um, the printer. This is going to be about a 12 foot uh, flat. Uh, it doesn't have any of the details underneath. I don't think I'm going to put details for these on these smaller cars, but we were able to add the uh, brake wheels and uh, some of the detail there. And I think that makes for a pretty nice model. The model that we have over there on the printer is equivalent to this one here. Uh, this we have, uh, pr have not painted anything yet, but we have two different uh, trucks on here. And again, we uh, had to get the metal wheels. I also made a little tray that goes in the top. So if you want to put a load in there, you don't have to load the entire car up with uh, that load. It, it will just be that uh, top tray. Here's another version of a uh, gondola. And again, it's just slightly different. This one doesn't have the braces on the sides. It just has the uh, stakes. And then uh, something that we're really happy with, and these I tried to show last time, I don't know how effective it was, but this is a water tender for a, uh, that goes to a climax uh, on my ON30 layout. Uh, we were able to duplicate the trucks on this by uh, uh, making those trucks and also the underside. And again, we added the wheels and the couplers. This has a top that comes off. So if a person wants to use this for a decoder, or if they want to use it for a battery for the dead rail guys, that'll work. Now, this is a rounded corner uh, tender, and this is the square corner tender. This is the one that I really started with, with the flutes on the top to model the uh, same type of finish that we have on the Climax itself. There's just a ton of things that we can do with 3D printing. Um, we had um, Larry Napwin a couple of weeks ago. And Larry, of course, is doing a lot of World War I stuff. I printed some stuff for him. And this is one of the, I think this is a, uh, um, well, I printed two for him. Uh, printed a lorry. And this is a, does anybody know what the brand of that is? Mac. Anyway, it's, it's a nice truck. And it's the right <laughs> side. Uh, this all was printed uh, as one piece on the underside. And then we printed the, uh, cab as another piece. And then there's a very a number of variations on the, uh, uh, the box that can go on the back. But uh, it gives us the opportunity to make a lot of things without having to buy a lot of things. Uh, and uh, that's all I'm going to say about that right now. The um, I told Jim in a conversation that we had, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, that I'll be happy to do a full-blown uh, presentation on 3D printing that goes into a lot more detail about the technology that uh, makes 3D printing work, including some of the software that you can use in order to design some of these pieces. But I think it's a great way for um, folks to get involved with the hobby if they're not into other aspects of the hobby. And I really believe that the technology like this is a way that we're going to pull a lot of the younger folks in with the type of things, the touch toggles that is being done by um, uh, Kevin Hunter and 
other folks that are doing 3D printing. It's a way that we can get the young people's interest back into the hobby. So I'll be happy to entertain any questions that anybody might have. What, what kind of, uh, are you selling any of these things? We're just starting to think about that, Jim. Um, uh, we've sold a couple of the tenders and uh, we went to the Harrisburg show uh, the last time, I guess it was in June, and we were feeling the waters. One of the big things is to try to find a price point that um, I like and that a customer would like. But I don't intend to go into a full-blown production. This will be kind of a almost a custom type of thing. Yeah. That was going to be my next question. How much for the truck? Um, you know, I don't even know. I haven't priced it. <laughs> I haven't priced it. I know that we're selling the uh, – I had a friend that uh, – is much more of a salesman than I am and took these tenders and uh, he got $45 for them. Mm -hmm. And I asked the same question of some folks up at Harrisburg and they said, that eh, might be a little bit high. So really it's going to be what the market will bear. Yeah. Well, they're beautiful models. They really are. And, you know, having, seeing that kind of a model compared to, you know, what some of us older people used to, to do scratch building out of whatever we thought we could work with. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's night and day. Well, the nice thing is with, uh, if you can see the, the uh, if I get some light on here, you can see all the rivets on the side and everything. Uh, it, you would think that it takes a lot of times to do that, but you only have to make one row of rivets and then you can duplicate it anywhere you want to. So it really cuts down the amount of time it takes to make these models. Mm -hmm. Granted, the software uh, has a fairly steep learning curve, but once you get the basics down, uh, everything else falls right out for you. But the kids today, they're learning that stuff in, in grade school, it seems oh. like. I'll tell you, I, uh, I take uh, a couple of courses at the local community college here in, in Maryland, and um, I went into this about three years ago. And I had already bought my first 3D printer and I went into the class and I thought, well, I mean, I got my 3D printer. I'm really going to be top dog. Well, I'll tell you, there was about 20, 20 year olds in there and I was the absolute bottom dog. They, these <laughs> kids really know what they're talking about. Bob, Bob which software do you use? I'm using a, a product by Autodesk called Inventor. Oh, yeah. OK. And it's got a, a hefty price tag to it. But uh, one of the reasons why I take a couple of courses at the community college is that if I can maintain my student status, then Autodesk will renew my license for the inventor every year for absolutely nothing. And it's like a $1,600 program. It's not cheap. Mm -hmm. But I use inventor uh, to do it. Um, and I also use a program called Prusa Slicer to actually slice the software once you get the basic design. And I'm, I'm not gonna go into great detail about that, but there's about two or three levels of software that you have to go through to go from concept to the final product, like this one over here. Bob, Greg Cassidy, I, uh, yeah, Greg. I'd i like to know what uh, makes you decide when you can use the filament printer or when you have to use the resin printer? Uh, good question. Um, if I wanna get great detail, I will go to the resin printer. However, uh, Prusa, the company that I have the printers from, just came out with a fairly new model. It's called the MK4. And it gives better detail. And also the nozzle size on it is smaller than the nozzle size on mine. So I'm gonna be testing that over the next couple of months to see if I can get a comparable quality with resin. The nice thing about resin is it's much quicker. On the filament printer, when you print, if it takes an hour to do one, it's gonna take six hours to do six. It's direct relationship. On the resin printer is if it takes an hour to do one, it'll take an hour to do six or as many as you can put on the build plate. And that's the real beauty of the resin printer. Yeah, the resin I can printer see has that. A lot, <laughs> yeah, the resin printer has a lot of downsides though. It has much more in the way of, of uh, post and pre uh, printing processing. Um, I managed, I'm going to put the camera back here to me. I managed uh, to put small blisters on my hands because I wasn't careful using gloves when I should have. Uh, where on a filament printer, you take it off and for instance, this one that I just took off, it's ready to go right now. 
no processing at all. So there's pros and cons to both. All right, thank you. Uh-huh. Bob, when you talk about detail, can you give us an example between the two uh, printers? What, what do you mean about the level of detail? Okay, the, um, the printers that I have right now, the ones that I showed you, um, they have nozzles that squirt out the, the plastic, the, the melted plastic, and that nozzle is a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. There are other nozzles that can go down to 0.25. But normally I would say that a layer, when you start, and this, this piece that I made here is made up of many, many, many layers as it works its way up to completion. These layers are 0.2 millimeters thick. On the resin printer, they're five hundredths of a millimeter thick. So the fact that you're being able to get very, very small layers on there means that you can get detail and greater depth. So it's probably about, oh, let's see what, uh, maybe a 10 times improvement in detail as compared to one of these guys. Now, I use my real filament printer for lots and lots of things. And as far as I'm concerned, because I model ON30 and I'm a firm believer in the three foot rule is that if the detail isn't perfect, it's okay. But if I'm gonna sell something, I'm probably gonna go with my resin printer in order to get the very best quality product that I can get. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think there's another thing there, that, Bob, you should talk about, which is <clears throat> there's a 0.4 millimeter or 0.3 millimeter printhead, right. which means, you know, so it's, it's kind of like to think about a re the way to think about this is that a filament printer is like a tube of toothpaste and you're squirting out toothpaste in a line and then you're building it up layer on layer on top of that line. Right. And so that's basically what it is. The thing that's happened with the resin printers is the resin printers basically use a, a screen that's light and it projects up. And as it projects up through the liquid, it basically causes a very thin layer to congeal. Right. It, it cures doesn't the congeal completely. It cures enough that it'll hold its shape. Right. So what happens then is the print bed pulls up a little bit. It just pulls away, and that's that five, that you know, that's that very small five one hundredths of a millimeter or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, essentially, it goes up that way. But the print bed itself is a screen. And so, you know, they started years ago when they first started building these, where you could buy them for cost effective. They were basically screens that came from um, tablets because those were readily available mm -hmm. or phones. And then they realized that a monochrome screen, a pure white screen was a lot better as so they started building those. Now they're up in volume. I mean, there was one that some, one of them just built is an 8K printer. So you gotta think about it, that's 8K wide this way on probably a seven or eight inch base. You know, that's 8,000 bits. So you look at how the, the width of each pixel essentially that congeals, it's a hundredth of what it is with a filament printer. So it's much smaller. And, right. and that's what's happening. What, what's happening with resin printing and this is really I think, exciting for us you know, in the hobby is that it's it is not a physical process. It's basically a process that's driven by electrical light generation. And so, you know, as as the technology goes, you're going to see something that's going to be 16K. And so all of a sudden the resolution, not just this way, going up and down is much less. Because the, the the toothpaste tube, you can't get really close. So this way, and the resin is really close. Now this way, getting higher and higher resolution. So you know you can, in the th scales we're doing, you can print things that are almost, you know, in invisible from being the real thing. So it's I think that's I Bob, you're absolutely right. When you start choosing the right thing, strength on one side, and but the resolution is getting to be pretty amazing. Oh yeah, and the what I found is that uh, it's almost impossible to keep up with the technology, because I've I've only been in it for probably about maybe four years, and the technology is just leapfrogging ahead. So the filament printers have gotten much much better. The resin printers not only are the resins improving, but also the technology, like you're saying. Uh, that makes these things up. The UV light, the light sources, the way they're able to focus the light. Everything, and um, one of the reasons why I'm hoping I can sell some of my product 
is that I can buy the better printers, but it's just going to take time. But it's 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 great fun to do this. And there's nothing like making something and actually it see, seeing it come to life in these printers. I mean, that's that's one of the great joys for me. Now, does it take time to design some of this stuff? Absolutely. Do I get it right the first time? Absolutely not. The rule of thumb is it takes me seven prints in order to get the final print. But, you know, um, I'm retired. I can handle that. Bob, when you started out, you talked about the learning curve. Yeah. And I'm assuming that the learning curve is the CAD design part of this process. Exactly. Exactly. So for, for, for a guy like me who has absolutely zero knowledge of any of mm -hmm. this, how long is my learning curve before I can at least uh, make a print that is a reasonable approximation of what I'm trying to make? Yeah, the... Um... It depends. There's a, a, a lot of software sitting out there, some free, some not so free. Um, realistically, I think it probably could take a couple of years okay. uh, with a lot of trial and error. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've made early on uh, really wasn't trained stuff. I made a lot of tool holders. I made a lot of, um, of uh, things like washers. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I never seem to have exactly what I need when I need it. Yeah. Uh, but instead of running to a hardware store now, if I need a washer a certain diameter, a certain thickness, I'll just print it. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of that um, is all part of the learning curve. And the, the other thing, too, is and, and I can thank Steve and a couple of other guys for this, is that when one is given a challenge to do something like to create something they've never made before, every time you do something like that, you learn a new trick. And you just keep compiling those tricks in your book of tricks until you be fair, you become fairly competent at doing it. I did a, uh, uh, we, we talked about John Weigel before. Um, John asked me to make a coach roof for a longer and narrower coach than you would normally get out of Bachman. So getting those curves on the end of that roof right took me a couple of days. But the nice thing is, once we got it right, then we can make a hundred of them. Right, All right, All right. But it it does take time. It's not going to be an overnight process, and that's the reason why there are companies that um, will do it all the work for you. To tell you the yeah. truth. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this: I keep hearing about this AI. Yeah. And the Im impact AI is going to have on, on our lives in a lot of different ways. What impact is AI going to have on, say, 3D printing? Are we getting close to a point where without having to spend two years of uh, time to do something, I can show a computer a picture of what I want to print and say, AI, design it and put it on the printer for me? Yeah, I, I think it could get there. Um, but I don't know exactly what that impact is going to be. For instance, um, one of the things that I'd really like to be able to get to eventually would be able to create my own figures, my own people. Um, that is not a, and I found out that I don't have that skill set right to, right now to start from scratch and model a human figure. There's a lot of people that are very, very good at it. Um, but you can get a scanner, and uh, people have done this already, is scan a, 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 a body mm -hmm. and then take that scanned information and shove that into the computer, and you wind up getting a, a, a human being, a model of a human being. Matter of fact, what's, uh, Steve, you probably know, what, is it Les Davis? Les Davis, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Les mm -hmm. did that with a number of, uh, of his friends, and he actually dressed them in period clothing. Yeah. And yeah. uh, very nice models. I asked Les if he would uh, sell me some of his files, and he said absolutely not. And I understand <laughs> that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think AI will be there. But Jim, I if, if you ask me what is going to be the ultimate, I can't give you an answer. I just don't know. Yeah, I just don't know. Well, I'm looking forward when you kind of come back on the show and, and do this more in depth. I really am, and, and I can't thank you enough for agreeing to do it. No, that's okay. I I love this stuff and. If anybody has any questions, um, my email is geldy, G-E-L-D-Y, at AOL.com. 
Um, I'll be happy to chat for as long as you want to talk uh, or, or give me a call. <laughs> but thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on tonight, Bob. Uh, my pleasure. It. So are you a 3D printer, Steve? I'm not a 3D printer. Nope. <laughs> I don't have one. It, it, listen, I was lucky that Bob came along with 3D printing and he got the education necessary to produce these things. Um, I, I have challenged him quite a few times <laughs> with some of this. Um, and he has come through. I have, you know, 50 cars here that he's produced for me. And uh, it's just been a, a wonderful experience to watch th this whole development. When you go over to his house, um, he's, he's got the printers in one room. He's got the tools in another room. He's got a computer in the room. You know, all these are separate areas. But if you want a design of something standard, you know, he has a file and he'll put it up and print it. You know, say, oh, I to be ready in eight minutes, 45 minutes or whatever. It, it's it, it's almost like magic, you know, from compared to when we were, you know, first started out in this stuff where the, the plastic was a quarter of an inch thick and you had no details hardly at all. It was just, man, this is just so neat. Um, I, I can't get over how wonderful it is to see this stuff. And when you're changing ideas as far as um, the location of your railroad and what type of railroad you're going to do, it, it's, it just makes it so much easier for the transition. Um, you know, when I sold all my standard O-N30 cars and went to the, to the kit bash items and, and the uh, two axles and things like this, uh, um, it just made it so much easier. Uh, I had a method. I was cutting trucks in half and uh, putting beams on. And uh, Bob came over one day and he said, "Let me see that." He said, "I can I can make one piece that'll go on that." And so he did. <laughs> and he put rivets on it and everything. And I said, "Well, I wasn't planning on that, you know." He kind of upgraded the modeling on the railroad, and uh, it just makes it really wonderful to have somebody like him as a friend. And this is just one of the things that you, when you meet other model railroaders, it doesn't matter what scale they are really, you just, you just feel like, you know, you know you've known them for a long time and, and you just share your ideas. And uh, once in a while they come over to ON30 and we're real happy to have them. Jim, I'll, I'll mention one thing. You talked about AI. Um, the programs that I use have a modeling technique called parametric modeling. And the best example is, uh, a window and uh, you could take a window and say that you're gonna design a window around the opening that that window is gonna fit into. And then all of the other uh, dimensions of that window are all based on that window opening. And once you've done that, then you can say, if I wanna change that window opening, everything else is done automatically for you. So that's one of the reasons why I probably will never buy another Tishy window because I make all my own. And the same thing yeah. with daughters. I'll never be in competition with him, but I don't have to buy from him. But he does make nice products though, so. What are, what are you so hard about uh, doing figures? Um, they're not real linear. Okay, I'm a linear thinker. And so for me to do things with have straight lines, uh, it's easy. But for me to take a basically a piece of clay and mold a body that looks like a body, um, I, I don't have that skill right now. And that's a, basically the same type of skill that you need uh, to make a figure in 3D. You can get a file that gets you started with that figure, but then you got to push and pull and do all kinds of things uh, to make that figure look like uh, you know somebody you would see on a railroad. And um, I haven't spent that much time trying to do it, but I, the times that I have done it, I've walked away and said, I'm going to stick with my straight line stuff. So, <laughs> but I've, I really would like to do that because, you know, if you put two or 300 figures on a railroad, you spent a lot of money. Oh, absolutely. You spent Jim, a lot I, of money. I think the other issue is you, there's discussion about the scanning. Um, I think this quality of the scanners, you know, you can buy a scanner on Amazon for a thousand 
dollars, that kind of number. I think the quality of the scan you get may not be good enough to use in a lot of, you know, model road when you get to O scale where, you know, in O scale, you got to think about it, a six foot figure is an inch and an inch and a half, inch and a quarter, an inch and a half tall. So, right. you know, and at that point, when you get in close, especially for photo, things are visible. And so you get defects where, you know, it doesn't read right and something sticks mm -hmm. out. And yeah. so you have to go in and edit all that. So, you know, I think there's a, if you have a really, really good scanner, I think, but I think the really good scanners, you're more in the three or $4,000 or more range. Uh, yeah. Um, multi multiply so I don't know. That, multiply or even that more. Five. Multiply that or by 20,000. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I really started doing a lot of this work at our local library in Westminster, Maryland. And uh, that's how I got into, you know, playing with the laser. But they also have um, a scanner up there. It's a $20,000 scanner. Uh, and even then, the guy told me when we were uh, went to the class on the scanner is that there's still a lot of, of post-production that you have to do in order to get the final figure looking like a person, because there are voids that the scan doesn't pick up. Hmm. But I agree with you. You know, it's all a matter of the quality of the scanner to get your person. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Just cut back on the number of people. <laughs> Anybody okay, have any more questions for Bob or for Steve? What's <laughs> the population? I mean, that's what I do. I got a, I got a whole drawer full of people. It, but, it's know. not a question, but uh, I had myself scanned last year, and, and you were talking about voids. Uh, it was done by Bernard at Mini Prints, and one of the things he had me do was remove my glasses. He said the scanner does not pick up glasses. So. Yeah. So yeah. all the little mini me's that I have, I'm not wearing glasses. Yeah. <laughs> I asked him if he could take care of my pot belly. He didn't do a damn thing. But you, but you can do that. You can do that. Okay. Yep. That's push and pull. Yeah. Wait, Maybe wait. So, so well, Greg, are you? Scratch, are, are, to scratch build your glasses. Uh, Greg. Maybe Bob can print those glasses for you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's slip them on. Yeah. Yeah, so now I have a little a little version of me standing in front of the bar on my layout. <laughs> it won't make any difference because you're still all going to look ugly. <laughs> I see Clark's back with us. That's right, baby. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, God. Uh, wow. Phil, what were you saying? Oh, I was just going to say say exactly the same thing, that you have to build gla make glasses now. That was... Uh -oh. You know, otherwise you're not prototypically correct and, you know, someone <laughs> will comment on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, coming out of a bar. I could have lost him. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, Steve, thank you so much for this evening. We really appreciate it. And pleasure. thank you for having us. Bob, I look forward to seeing you later. Okay. <laughs>